Our kind and loving Father, we just humbly thank you so much for your love and your mercy towards us, Father. We just thank you so much for Calvary. We just thank you so much for the blood that was shed on Calvary for us. That we can still come to the foot of the cross, Lord, and we can still come and ask you, Lord, please forgive us our sins and to cleanse our hearts, Father. We just thank you so much for the blood that washes white in snow. We just thank you so much for the doors of mercy still being open for us, that we can still come and plead our case to you. We ask now to build the meeting, to be with us, just to be the equipment, and to build everything, Father. We love you so much, and we ask you, Lord, that you speak through me, Lord. Let thy will be done. May you be revealed in everything that we do tonight, Lord. We love you so much. The all is unworthy of the Son of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. Uh, Saints, today is a very interesting topic I want to discuss with us. A very interesting topic, a topic sometimes we take for, for granted. And um, so we're going to be deep in details on this topic that we're discussing today. You know, there is um, there is something that engages the angels. They like to study this thing. Not only the angels, but the un the unborn worlds, the other worlds also like to study the same thing. What we are about to study right now. The prophet says that this topic that we've been discussing, with the prophet even says that it engages the attention of Jesus to. Even Jesus himself engaged the attention of Jesus. You see, it's not the only the, the angels who like to study this thing here, not the only the unfolding, the unfolding world who likes to study this thing, but even engages the attention of Jesus. And not only Jesus also, but prudence the mind of the eternal Father. Imagine, it also prudence the mind of the eternal Father. So not only the angels, not only the unfallen world, and not only Jesus, but also the Father, the food in the Father's mind. You know, um, and that's this what this study, what the angels like, what the unfallen ones, and what Jesus and what the, the Father is looking for is called the plan of redemption. Sometimes when I say, why do we study the plan of redemption? Um, we advances for so many years, we advances. We know about the plan of redemption. We don't need to study about the plan of redemption. But you know what the spirit of property says that, that we've got to study it because this is something that's going to be studied even in heaven. Even in heaven itself, it's going to be studied there too. So we can't not, we can't, can't leave it aside and stop studying it. You see, it engages the angels, it engages the unfallen world, it engages the Father, it engages Jesus Christ. So why should we stop studying this if it engages all the others? Who are we? A simple being. So we need to study this is what we need to study. So inspiration says, uh, says that this, um, if it engages the Father, right, and Jesus, and observes the attention of the angels, even the unfallen inhabitants of the other worlds. So all of them are fixed on this one thing. They're all fixed on the plan of redemption because the plan of redemption is going to help us. It's going to help us to get ready. That's what's going to help us for the plan of redemption. You know, the plan of redemption is right. Then we all will be lost. Each and every one of us will be lost if the plan of redemption is right. Brothers and sisters. That's why it's so important to study the plan of redemption. You know, Satan trembles when we come and study the plan of redemption. Satan trembles. I'm telling you, he trembles because he knows he gets exposed. And Satan don't want to get exposed. That's why he drifts our minds away when we hear about the plan of redemption. He drifts the minds of the attention away from us because he knows if we engage in studying the study of the plan of redemption, he will be exposed. And he doesn't want to be exposed, saints. He doesn't want to be exposed at all. You know, do you know that um, 
the book Desire of Ages. In Desire of Ages, the chapter that's called is finished. There's a chapter in Desire of Ages where it's called is, is finished. Just listen to this, what it says. It says in the book Desire of Ages, right? The chapter is called is finished. It says, the prophet says, even the angels never fully understood. Right? What did they understood? So in Desire of Ages, it says, even the angels never fully understood. Imagine that the angels themselves have been watching the great controversy. The angels themselves have been watching the great controversy. Even then, they never fully understood. Even then, the angels never fully understood the plan of redemption. But they've been watching it, but they still never understood the plan of redemption. You know, um, since the prophet says, says, for the angels' sakes, and for our sakes, the Satan's existence must prolong. Satan's existence must prolong for the angels' sake and for our sakes. Some some people say, but why? Why can't you destroy can't Jesus or God destroy Satan straight away? Saints, he can't. He can never destroy Satan straight away. Because then it will look like that God is a murderer and is hiding some things. So God leads us to play out. That's why it's called the plan of redemption, because God leads everything to play out. So Satan can be exposed and see, and everybody can see. Me and you, the angels can see what type of being Satan. Satan's only alive because of us. In Desire of Asia, it tells us that God is preserving his life because of men, because of you and me, that God is preserving Satan's, Satan's life. We are actually keeping Satan alive. There is something that man needs to do first, the prophet says. There is something that man needs to do first before Satan can be destroyed. I like us to just to go to the, um, do something in education. In the book Education 126, in 126, the book Education, I'd like to read something out to you and just see how, how this plan is working out. In um, Education 126, it says there, Education 126, I won't read the whole thing of Education 126. We're only going to read the first half and then later on we'll go into the second half. So I'm going to read the first half in 126. Education 126. It says here, listen to this very carefully. I want you to pay attention to this, what I'm going to say. I'm a little bit slowly so we can hear and we can see what is going on. And I just hope that everybody can have their pens, their papers, their Bibles ready to take down notes, take down quotation notes, take down Bible verses. So we will go back, we read it, and study ourselves to show ourselves the proof. Because the word of God said that we should study ourselves. Line upon line, precept upon precept. So I believe that we should take our pens, paper, and the Bible and take our conversation because this study will get very interesting. This study will get sweet, brothers. So as we go and dig deep into the study, we're going to see how much God really loves us. And it says there in Education 126, that's what it says there. The first, the first part I'll read it says, The science of redemption is the science of all science, the science that is studied of the angels and of all intelligence of the unfallen worlds, the science that engages the intention of our Lord and Savior, the science that enters into the purpose rooted in the mind of the infinite. So let's listen to the secret from the guy. Now, just, just, you got to listen, this is very careful, this is sweet, this is sweet science, this is sweet. It says that, I'm going to read it again, huh? the science, what it says there, the science of redemption, not any redemption, but the science of redemption is the science of all science. So the first part says, the science of redemption is the science of all science, right? Then it says, the science that is studied of angels. Yeah, the science that is studied of angels, of all intelligence, 
of all unfallen worlds, the signs that engage the attention of our Lord and Savior, the signs that enter into the purpose and prudence in the mind of the incarnate. So we see a sense, a sense there, this we need to study this uh, because, uh, as I said in the beginning, it engages the angels, uh, uh, being, it engages the Father and the unfolding worlds. So we want to study this. Uh, so we see here also that the, the angels are in school, they are studying. What they are studying is the science of redemption. That's what they are studying is the science of redemption. The science of redemption is the science of all science. As we saw in the inspiration, it says the science of all science. Not just only the all the intelligence of this phenomenal world, but the plan of redemption. Listen to this carefully. The plan of redemption was not revealed to the angels. Do you know that the plan of redemption existed? Now you want to say, what, 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 what's going on here? What's going on here? Okay, this, this, this is this. The plan of redemption, guys, was not revealed to the angels. All right? Mm -mm. The plan, I understand what you're saying. The plan, the plan of redemption was not revealed to the angels. Okay? So we see here that the plan of redemption that the plan of redemption existed. All right? The plan of redemption existed before even the angels at that time. It existed in the mind of God. Also, physical objects of the plan of redemption in their sight. But, but you know that even, even then, the angel couldn't see or fully understood the understood the plan of redemption. Even then, in heaven, you know, the plan of redemption was there, but they never fully understood the plan of redemption, even then. Do you know that, that the angels didn't even know the cause for existence? You must be thinking, but what's, what's, what's going on here? What's going on here? Yes, the angels, they didn't even know the cause of existence. Existed. You might say, why? This is why. This is why. I'm going to read this from Mount of Blessings. In, in the book, Mount of Blessings, it says this here. It tells you why. In Mount of Blessings, it says, when Lucifer rebelled as if they woke up from a dream and realized there is a law. Only when Lucifer rebelled in heaven, the angels realized there is a law. Like they woke up from a dream and said, oh, there is a law. Only when Lucifer rebelled, then they realized there is a law. They were so in harmony with the law that the law did not exist. You see, the angel was so in harmony with the law that, that the law did not even exist because they were so in harmony with the law, they were so in harmony with God. To them, they naturally, they naturally, they were naturally in harmony with God, you see? Only when Lucifer rebelled, then they thought law, and their minds turned back to the law. Only when Lucifer rebelled, then they realized there was a law, because they were so in harmony with the law, they were in harmony with God. So they didn't need to know, know about the law in anything, because everything what they doing was so perfect, and they were doing things with God. You know, the Bible, the, in the Bible it says, the way of God is in, okay, sorry. You know, before the, you know what existed in earth, um, in heaven, before the angels, before anything else, what was existed in heaven? You know what existed in heaven? It was the sanctuary. The sanctuary existed in heaven before even the angels. The sanctuary existed in heaven. Now you think about what's going on here. How can the sanctuary exist in heaven before the angels? Listen to this. Uh, 
In the Bible, it says the way of God is in the sanctuary. So it says God's way is where? In the sanctuary. And what does the sanctuary reveal? The sanctuary reveals his redemption. You know, the sanctuary reveals redemption. The plan of redemption is in the sanctuary. That's why we say the sanctuary existed before even the angels. You know, how do we know the sanctuary existed before them? How do we know the sanctuary existed before them? In, you're not going to even turn there, but this is a very familiar text, a very familiar uh, text I'm going to uh, say, but we're not going to turn there. In Revelation 14, verse 6, we all know this, sir. In Revelation 14, verse 6, the Bible says, the everlasting gospel. So how long did the gospel exist? So we can say that the gospel existed as the everlasting, because it is the everlasting gospel, right? The everlasting gospel, so the gospel existed forever. In the sanctuary, does the sanctuary have anything to do with the gospel? Does the sanctuary have anything to do with the gospel? Yes, I would say yes. The sanctuary has everything to do with the gospel. So, if the gospel is everlasting, right? We see here that the gospel is everlasting. So, we can rightly say that the sanctuary was everlasting. Because if the gospel is everlasting, obviously the sanctuary is everlasting. Because the gospel and the gospel has got everything to do with the sanctuary. So, the sanctuary existed as long as God existed. Or the everlasting gospel, as long as God existed. So the sanctuary existed as long as God existed, so is the gospel, okay? Before God created anything, he first created the sanctuary. Before God created anything, he first created the sanctuary. And Lucifer was part of the furniture. You know that yet? Lucifer was, we know we see the sanctuary, how it is. Lucifer was part of, his, of, of the sanctuary. He was a covering shadow. He was one of them, the covenant ship of the century. So, so brothers and sisters, so who is engaged in the study that we are reading now? Which means engaged in the study we are doing now? Can we rightly say everybody must be engaged in the study? Because if the Father is engaged, if, the, if Jesus is engaged, if the angels are engaged, the, the unfallen world is engaged. So must we be engaged also. So must we be engaged. So everybody needs to be engaged. You know. Now, I'd like to read back into education, the other parts of education 126 in the bottom part. I read the first half, now I'm reading the, the bottom part in 126. In 126 of education, 126, it says here, <clears throat> The signs that will be a study of God's redeemed through endless ages. This is the highest study. The highest says, this is the highest study in which it is possible for man to engage. As no other study can, it will quicken the mind and uplift the soul. So we see here is that it says that the science that will be studied of God's redeeming through endless ages, when it says through endless ages, that is whatever, through endless ages, this is the highest study in which it's possible for man to engage. So this is the highest study. There's no study that is higher than this. It says this is the highest study. Is there any study that is higher than this study? No. No, there is no study that's higher than this study. You see, because in, in the inspiration, a says that there's no other study that can quicken the mind and uplift the soul. No other study can, can quicken the mind and uplift the soul. And we all need our minds to be quickened and our souls to be uplifted. So we need to study the plan of redemption. When we do, when we, when do we stop studying the plan 
of redemption. I say never. We will never get tired of studying the plan of redemption. This is the highest study. Is there anything higher than this? No. There's no, there's nothing higher than this study. Inspiration tells us this is the highest study. This study will quicken the mind and uplift the soul. So we need to quicken our minds and we need to uplift our soul. God has a school, saints. God has a school. And his subject is called the plan of redemption. God's school is a plan of redemption. I want to be part of God's school. And I know you want to be part of God's school. Let's turn to our Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, verses 12. 1 Peter 1, verses 12. Remember, brothers and sisters, to take down notes, have a pen, paper, and take down notes. Take down notes for the quotation, take down for the scripture reading, and go over it yourself, study some of you, and see what God has for you. Amen. Um, 1 Peter 1, verse 12. 1 Peter, it says there, 1 Peter 1, verse 12. 1 Peter 1, verse 12. It says, <clears throat> Amen. Can be there? Amen. It says there, 1 Peter 1, verse 12. <clears throat> Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things. We shall now report it unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angel desire to look at. I'm going to read the bottom part again. It says there in the bottom. Unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angel desire to look into. The angel desire to look into this. What this what is that the angel desire to look at? The desire to look in is the plan of redemption. That's what the desire. The Bible tells us that the angel desire to look into is the plan of redemption. Now, saints, now I want us to go deep, deep uh, to dig deeper now into the study. That was the basis of the study that we are doing. Now we go deeper into the study. So I pray my Lord help us as we go deep, deep into the study. Let's just bow our heads as we go deep, deep into the study. Amen. Our kind and loving Father, we humbly thank you so much for your love, Father. We thank you for the blessing created us to be part of the blessing, to study your words, a blessing for us to know what the plan of redemption, because no Father has to help us, Father. You also now to help us, Lord, as we study now, Father, Lord, please, Lord, open up our minds, open up our hearts, Father, Lord, to receive what you have to have for us, Father. Please, Lord, help us, Lord, as we study this, Father, that we will really, really, really Take this, say, Lord, and really apply in our lives, Father, Lord. We know, Lord, this is going to help us, Lord. This is really going to help us. We know that you are about to come, Jesus. You are, you are about to come. And you want the people to be there. Please, Lord. Please, Lord, have mercy on us. And help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, saints, now, now we're going deep. As I said, we went deep now into the study. That was the basic. Now we went deep into the study. That's what it says. Now we're going, we're going to study the sealing work. Someone might say, why were we studying the plan of redemption? Because it's a different thing to the sealing work. We're just studying about the sealing work. Now it's about the plan of redemption. What's, what's going on? Why are we starting the plan of the plan of the generation? I went to see them. 
but we not completed the plan of detention for the champion is succeeding. So it's, <clears throat> is there anything linked to the plan of redemption and the seeding work? Is there anything linked to the plan of redemption and the seeding work? Let us see in our Bibles. Let's turn to our Bible to Ephesians 4 verses 30. Ephesians 4 verses 30. But as a sister, this thing can get sweet. It can get sweet like honey. Ephesians 4 verses 30. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 verses 30. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 30 says, <clears throat> it says here, Ephesians 4 verses 30. We now be talking about is there anything linked between the plan of redemption and the seeding? Let us see what the Bible says. Ephesians 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So, saints, it says here that we are sealed, okay? We are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we can see here in the Bible says the sealing that we are sealed on the day, up to the day of redemption. What is redemption? The day of redemption. So we are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we see here that, the, that so there is a link between the sealing work and, and redemption. The Bible shows us in the Bible says it, that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. So redemption and the sealing work are linked together. So we can rightfully say that the, the seeding work and redemption are linked together. When Jesus died on the cross, was the plan of redemption finished? When Jesus died on the cross, was the plan of redemption finished? I would say no. It was the first phase. It was only the first phase when Jesus died on the cross. That was only the first phase of the plan of redemption. Science. That was only the first phase. There's going to be a final phase in the redemption side. Where is the final phase of redemption? Can we rightfully say the final phase of redemption is the most holy? The final phase of redemption is the most holy. Can we rightfully say that is the final phase is the most holy? There is a connection with the plan of redemption and the most holy and the sealing work, they all connected together. The plan of redemption, the plan of redemption, most holy and the sealing work is all connected together. You know, um, in Luke, in Luke 21, Jesus speaks to his disciples, he gives them his final instruction. As much as he's speaking to the disciples, this is more application for us saints. As much as he's speaking to the disciples here, yeah, but this applies to us more. It's more application for us than for the disciples. Let us turn and see what was the instruction that Jesus gave to the disciples. What was the instruction? That instruction will it benefit us. Let us see in Luke 21, verses 34 to 36. Luke 21, verse 34 to 36. Luke 21, verse 34 to 36. Amen. Luke 21, verse 34 to 36. That's what it Luke 21, 34 to 36. 34 to 36. And take heed to yourself. They say, any time your heart be overcharged with sufficient and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that they, that, that, that they come upon you unawareness. Verse 35, for as the snares shall come on all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Verse 36, verse 50, watch ye Therefore, and pray always 
which I may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So we see here in the last verse here in, in uh, the last uh, um, yeah, the last verse it says that watch ye therefore and pray always. So he's saying that we need to watch and we need to pray always, okay? So it's watch therefore and pray always that shall we be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So what does it mean to watch? You know, because it says that, it doesn't say that we must pray only. Because it says there that, you know, that we must watch and pray. Because not merely by praying, sometimes we're just thinking that, if, oh, we can go to heaven, we'll make it in the day of judgment if we just pray and pray. No. It's not, no, we won't make it by just praying. We've got to watch and pray. What does it mean to watch? We all know what it means to pray. Everybody knows what it means to pray, to go on our knees and to pray. But what does it mean to watch? Let us see what it means to watch. In Habakkuk, uh, okay, let's just turn there. Let's just turn there so we can know where we can get. Let's turn to Habakkuk. Habakkuk 2 verses 1. Let's just see what it means to watch. What does it mean to watch? Habakkuk 2 verses 1. Habakkuk 2 verses 1. Habakkuk is there by Daniel, and then you get Joel, as well as there in between there. Habakkuk 2 verses 1. It says it. Habakkuk 2 verses 1. I, stand, I, will, sorry, I will stand upon my watch. Can you hear? I will stand upon. Habakkuk said, I will stand upon my watch, and I set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. So we see here that Habakkuk says, I'm standing upon my watch to hear what God says to me. So Habakkuk is telling us what it means to be watched. He says that I'm standing upon my watch to hear what God has to say to me. So what does it mean to watch? It means to watch is, is, it, it means to study and to read the Bible. And to, to study and read the Bible and pray. So it's not merely by just praying. We also need to study. We need to study the word of God for ourselves and we need to pray. So to, to watch it means that we need to watch and to learn and study and pray. That's the meaning of watch. So to Jesus tell his disciples to watch, to study and pray. So that application must send to disciples, that application is for me and you. That is for me and you to watch and pray. To watch and pray. And you know, when we go looking, see in um, in Luke, when um, Jesus was in Gethsemane, he said to the disciples, he said, watch, ye therefore, lest you fall into temptation. Saints, so we see here, to watch is to study and to read the Bible. So we need to study and pray, saints. And Jesus says, he wants to do a people that can stand. So we saw there's also talks about that to stand. So Jesus wants to do a people who can stand. In Revelation 6 verse 17, the question is, who is able to stand? So the question was asked in Revelation 6 uh, verse 17, who is able to stand? Are you and I able to stand? So saints, in the mind of Jesus, he wants to develop a people who can stand. Jesus wants to get a people 
ready. Jesus wants to get a people ready who can stand. Once Jesus can get a people ready who can stand, the plan of redemption ends. Only then will the plan of redemption end when he gets the people to stand. Someone might say, but how can the plan of redemption end if you're going to start it all until eternity? The work, the plan of redemption work ends on earth. But it has to end on earth. But when we're in heaven, we think we're starting the plan of redemption. But it has to end on earth, the controversy between Jesus and Satan. Who's going to be able to stand in their kind of day? Out of me and you. Who's going to be able to stand on that day? The final plan, the final plan of redemption is the sealing work. People might say, why are we talking about the sealing, the sealing work? Because why are we talking about the sealing work? I'll tell you why we're talking about the sealing work. But the sealing work is present truth for this time. It's present truth for now. For this hour, it is present truth for now. That's why we need to speak about the sealing work. We need to speak about the plan of redemption as the, as the present truth for now, for our time. Jesus is about to come, says. Jesus is about to come. I'd like us to read in uh, Volume 5 of the Testimonies, 575. 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 Okay. All right, it says here, volume 5, 575. It says, listen to this carefully, sons. The great plan of redemption is revealed in the closing work of this last days. So we see here, yeah, inspiration tells us why we need to study the plan of redemption. It says that a great plan of redemption has revealed in the closing work of this last days, we all live in these last days, should receive close examination. It says that a great plan of redemption is revealed in the closing work of these last days and should receive a close examination. The scenes connecting with the century above should make such an impression upon the minds and hearts of all who may be able to impress others. So we see here, yeah, they said the scenes connected, the scenes connected with the sanctuary above should make such impressions upon the minds and hearts of all that may be able to impress others. Then it continues, the says, all need to, all need, sorry, all need, sorry, all need to become more intelligent in regarding to the work of the atonement. What is the work of the atonement? Which is going on in the century above. When this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold its work in harmony with Christ to prepare people to stand in that great day of God, their efforts will be successful. By studying Contemplating contemplations and prayer, God's people will be elevated above common. Earthly thoughts, feelings will be brought in harmony with Christ and his great work of the cleansing of the century from sins and from their people. So I'm going to read from there. It says that what this will help us to do for it. if we study this and this it will make us be in harmony. We'll be in harmony with Christ and his great work. And we'll elevate our thoughts, our minds, and our feelings. All will be in thoughts to harmony with Christ. Then the carries on and says there, their faith will go with him into the sanctuary. So we see here that our faith will go with Jesus into the sanctuary. And the worshippers on earth will be carefully reviewing their lives and comparing their characters 
with the Christ standard of righteousness. So there's a standard here. There's a Christ standard of righteousness, right? They will see their own defects. They will also see that they must have the aid of the Spirit of God if they would become qualified for the great and solemn work for this time, which is laid upon God's ambassadors. So saints, you can see how important this is for us, especially in this last days. So saints, we see here that the great plan of redemption is the work of atonement that is going on above the cleansing of the sanctuary. If we want to, if we want to have a people to stand by the system, if we want to have a people to stand, what's the topic that we need to engage in and draw, draw the people's minds to? Can we rightly say it is not the plan, yeah, but the great plan of redemption? The great plan of redemption is what happened to God in So, in order for us to draw the people, we need to draw the people, we need to study the plan of redemption of them and draw their minds in. Anything else shorter than this uh, that is not present truth. Anything else shorter than the plan of redemption, it is not present to the science. So now says, let us see now. What takes place just before the seed? Let's see. In, the, in Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 8, verses 15. Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 15. Just before the ceiling, what takes place in Ezekiel 8, verses 15? It says that Ezekiel 8, verses 15, just before the ceiling, that's what takes place. And then said he unto me, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see a greater abomination than this. So we see here, yeah, the question was asked, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, thou shalt see greater abomination than this. What abomination are going to see in this? Let's see in verse 16. What is the great abomination? And he brought unto me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east and they worshipped the sun towards the east. So we see what's taking place just before the Sunday Lord takes place is that they will worship it. the sun worship. What is sun worship? We know the sun worship is Sunday worship. So just before the ceiling takes place, there needs to be sun worship. Sun worship, Sunday worship. And then afterwards, and then Ezekiel 9 tells us that the ceiling takes place. So just be all, just after Ezekiel 8 verse 15 to 16, the sun worship, then the ceiling starts taking place in Ezekiel 9. The ceiling begin, began. Let's see when did the ceiling begin. Let us read in Maranatha, Maranatha 200. And let's see when did the ceiling begin. Maranatha 200. The size here. Maranatha 200. It tells us here when the ceiling began. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their forehead, it is not, just not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. So they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed in preparation for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has began already. Indeed, it has began already. 
We saw in our study, um, the other week in our study about the shaking, I said in the same quotation there, I said that the shaking has really begun. Remember, we spoke, we spoke about the shaking and the first phase of the shaking has really begun. And we remember that the first phase first of the shaking has began, was began in 1902, was the first part of the shaking. So now it says that the ceiling has really begun. So if the ceiling is beginning, what year did the ceiling begin? Can we rightly say 1902 that the ceiling has begun? Because if the shaking has begun in 1902, obviously the ceiling has begun also in 1902. So we see here what comes first, the ceiling, then the shaking. If you are already in the shaking, what does that imply about the ceiling? As I said, there is two parts of the ceiling signs. There is two parts of the ceiling. We are already in the first part of the ceiling signs. Like the shaking, like the, like the shaking, we saw there were two parts of the shaking. In the ceiling, there's two parts of the ceiling. We are already in the first part of the ceiling signs. The first part of the ceiling is called preparation. It's called preparation. We're in the preparation time where we are preparing ourselves for the second ceiling, for the final ceiling. And the bushes, the first ceiling already began. It began in 1902, the first ceiling. You can check me up, you can see in the writings in uh, Spirit, Spirit of Prophecy, I will tell you that in 1902, shaking began. In 1902, the ceiling, the first ceiling began. The second part of the ceiling is called the final, the final ceiling. The last scene, the final scene. The woman of God says, the shaking has begun in 1902 when she wrote this. In 1902, we have been in the ceiling and the shaking has begun. So that means that the ceiling, as I said, the ceiling has begun. So we are in the ceiling, we are about to enter into the final. We are about to enter into the final shaking, into the final ceiling. So saints, there's a question my saints, I would like to ask. Should the Sunday law be enforced today? Should the Sunday law be enforced today? Not one of us will receive the sin of God. Not one of us will receive the seal of God if the Son of Law has been forced to do. Why? Because the work has begun in our hearts, but not been completed. The work has begun, since, but it hasn't come to a complete. You know, the Sabbath is a sign of God's complete sense. The Sabbath is sign of God's complete. The Sabbath was on the seventh day. And the seventh day is God's complete number. And we say the Sabbath makes it a complete work. So we see here that God's work came, was, was came to a complete with the Sabbath. When the Sabbath came in, God's work came to a complete and came to a perfection. So that's why now God wants us to bring us back to perfection. God wants to bring you and I back to perfection. In Psalms, let's turn to Bible to Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Amen. Psalms 37. Saints, Jesus is coming, saints. Jesus is coming, saints, and everything is so clear out as we are studying um, on Sabbath and uh, right Devine was sharing with us and we can see that this is it, saints. This is it. This is it. This is the time now for everything it's about to be shaken. It's going to be shaken out. 
the stars will be standing by pulpits and be preaching 17 years, 20 years. I cannot set them in the to be shaken out. It's not me, but no one in the truth. So science is not merely by knowing the truth. It's not merely by knowing the truth. We need to be settled into the truth. It's very scary, son. It's very scary. It's not one in hundreds. It's not one in hundreds. It's gonna make a sense. Let's turn to Psalms 137. I mean, sorry, Psalms 37, verse 37. Psalms 37, verse 37. It says that, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. So it says that, Mark the perfect man, behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. So we see here, in order to get the mark, not just any mark, sense, in order to get the mark, God's mark, our condition must be perfect. So we need to come to a stage of perfection. We need to come to a stage of perfection to order to get the mark. To get God's mark, we need to come to a perfection. So before the Sunday law, the work of preparation must be finished. So just before the Sunday law says, the work of preparation must be finished. We can't do preparation on the Sunday law. It will be too late. So before the preparation, uh, before the Sunday, Lord, the work of preparation must be finished. God must bring us back to perfection. God needs to bring you and I back to perfection. So before the Sunday, Lord, we must be perfect. But the Sunday, Lord, would only... It says that, but the Sunday, Lord, only will we get the final seal is at the Sunday, Lord. Only at the Sunday, Lord, will we can get the final seal is at the Sunday, Lord. The final stage, which is beyond perfection. So now we see saints, it's not merely by getting to be perfect. Yes, before the Sunday law, we need to be perfect, saints. We need to be perfect before the Sunday law. But there's something that goes beyond, beyond perfection. Then we need to come to a stage where it's beyond perfection. Maybe you can say, but is there anything beyond perfection? If you're perfect, you're perfect. How can we say there's something beyond perfection? Saying so there is something that's beyond perfection. There is something that's beyond perfection, and that's what we're going to deal with now. This is what we're going to be dealing with now, with what is beyond perfection. There's something I want to ask. Some, a question I want to ask. Was Adam perfect? Yes, Adam was perfect, but he moved and he fell. Those who received the second phase of the ceiling, as says there in Maranatha, those who received the second phase of the ceiling, says in the bottom part, says they cannot be moved. It says once you receive the ceiling, you are settled in the truth and you cannot be moved. So you need to be settled in the truth and not be moved to receive the seal. Which part? of the ceiling we are in now. We are we in the preparation for the final scene. Since we are in the preparation scene, which is about to end. We are in the preparation scene now, which is about to end. The final scene takes place at the National Sunday Law. As we all know, that the final scene takes place at the National Sunday Law. I'd like to just read into Testimonies to Ministers 445. Testimonies to Ministers 445. It says here. <clears throat> Testimonies to Ministers 445. Listen to this carefully. This ceiling of the servant of God, <clears throat> sorry, this ceiling of the servant of God is the same that was shown to Ezekiel. 
in vision. John also had this, John also had been a witness of this most striking revelation. He saw that the sea and the waves roaring and men's hearts are facing them for fear. He behold the earth and moved, and the mountains carried into the midst of the sea, which literally is taking place. The waters thereof roaring, troubles, and mountains shaking, but swelling thereof. So we see yes, sir, that the same ceiling that Ezekiel saw is the same ceiling that John saw. As the same ceiling. So in Ezekiel 9 and Revelation 7, as the same ceiling. So what we see in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 9 and Revelation 7, it's the same ceiling that we see. That we see, saints. It's the same ceiling. And in order to get the ceiling, we need to be perfect, right? So we need to come to a state of perfection. We need to come to what does it mean to be in a state of perfection? Let us see in Genesis, Genesis 2, verses 1 to 2. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 2. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 2. A size here. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them were so. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works, which he had made. So we see, it says, that the word, you know the word finish means? The word finish means brought to perfection. The word finish, you can look it up in the, in the, in the French Word Dictionary. The word finish means brought to perfection. Perfection. So the Sabbath is a sign of God's complete work of creation. When God blessed the Sabbath, that was a sign of God's complete work of creation. When He brought it to perfection, the Sabbath is a sign that's brought back to perfection. God's complete work. Okay? Which day is the mark of the beast? Sunday. Sunday is the mark of the beast. You know, saints, in Genesis 1, when in Genesis 1, was that God's complete work <clears throat> or was his beginning? <clears throat> in Genesis 1, was that God's complete work or was that the beginning of work? We can say it's the beginning. We say that's the beginning. You know, if God had to stop in Genesis 1 and say, just stop right there, the work would be an incomplete work. It would be an incomplete work if God has to stop right there. His work would be incomplete. So, saints, everyone who receives the mark of the beast, if every if, if, so everyone who receives the mark of the beast begins the Christian rites, but never go to the end of it. So all those who receive the mark of the beast, they begin the rites, but they never go to the end of the rites. So when the time to receive the mark of the beast says, there's only going to be two sides. There's going to be God's side and there's going to be Satan's side. So there's going to be no eight years. There's going to be no eight years. That time, the eight years has to make a decision. Is either choosing God or is choosing Satan's side. Everyone who receives the mark of the beast has start the Christian place, but never go to affection. So those who, those who receive the mark of the beast, they start the Christian walk, but they never go to a stage of perfection. Science, we know that Adam was perfect, but he was moved. Lucifer was perfect, but he was moved. The final generation, that's you and I, will be perfect and settled 
that we won't be moved. We go beyond the place of Adam. We're going to go beyond the place of Lucifer. So wherever Adam stopped by his first stop, we're going to go beyond that place, a place where we're going to be settled and not be moved. A place where we're not going to be moved, sons. This is why God says we're so special in his eyes. Because we are the final generation. There's no generation after this generation. This is the final generation. This is the generation where it's going to make a decision. We either serve God or we serve Satan. Saints, you can. <clears throat> You can see here, uh, you can see this thing says, this is so sweet, saints. This is so sweet, saints. You know, when you study the plan of redemption, you start to see in black, it comes sweet, saints. It really comes sweet if we really study into it. Because the angels have to study the same. God likes to engage in this. Jesus engages us. The unfolding inhabitants of the world engages in this sin. So should you and I engage in this sin. And we should make it sweet like honey. Perfection is a preparation work, saints. Perfection is a preparation work. But the final phase of the ceiling is settling that one cannot be moved. So perfection is a preparation work, right? But the final phase of the seeding is settled and, and now that one cannot be moved. So we need to be settled and not can be moved. We see Satan and um, Lucifer was perfect. Adam was perfect. But they moved. They fell. So just a God said we must be must be just be perfect. We must go beyond perfection. So that we not be moved, we be settled in the truth. After God seals his people, saints, listen to this here. This is what the prophet, this is what the prophet says. After God seals his people, Satan comes to him and says, Give me a right to them. Christ says, You can go, just do not take them. This is the great controversy. This, you can read this in great controversy, says. The prophet says he comes back and he goes and he tests them to the utmost. You know the agony they're going to go through. In Isaiah, 50, in Isaiah 54, it says that, that God says he will hide his face for a little moment. In other words, they are not going to feel the presence of God or the acceptance of God. When Satan comes with the test, those who want to make it are not going to feel the presence of God or the acceptance of God. Because God is going to hide his face for a little while. You know, when Jesus comes, his people who are perfect and settled, that's the 144. She says, the prophet says, the righteous face turns pale. She says, the righteous cry out and says, who is able to stand? And the host of heaven stopped. At that moment, and the righteous are going to cry out and say, and turn, the face turns pale. The prophet says, they cry out and says, who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? And the host of heaven will stop with amazement. And they watch the scene as the 144 cry out, Who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? And then Jesus cries out. Jesus comes and cries out and says, My grace sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Do you know that that's the last words mortal ears is going to ever hear? 
my grace is sufficient for you. We'll never come to a place that we don't need God's power and strength. We'll never come to a place where we don't need God's power and strength and his grace. The 144,000, they came to a place where they said, who is able to stand? And Jesus cried out, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. So it's a little scene of Ezekiel. Our loss, <clears throat> we will finish with your army up now. In, our loss. in Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to 6 and 8. Ezekiel 9, verses 1, 6, verses 1 to 6 and 8. It says here, Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to 6 and 8. Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to 6 and 8. It says here, verses 1. He cried also in my ears, and with a loud voice saying, Cause them to have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the high head, which lieth towards the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen and with the writer's ink, ink on by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Verses 3. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherubim, whereabout, whereupon he was to threshold of the house, and called to the man clothed with linen, which had a righteous in by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go to the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem, set a mark upon the foreheads of men that sighed and cried for all the combination that are done in the midst thereof. Verses 5. And to others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him to the city, smite, let not your eyes fear, neither have ye any pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient man which were there at the house. Verses 8. And it came to pass while they were slaying slain them, I was left that I fell upon my face and cried and said, O oh Lord, will I destroy all the residents of Israel in the pouring out of the glory upon Jerusalem? So we see here, yes, saints, that when the destroying angel comes, he slays all little children and women. There's no one that he spares. Because God says, don't have pity on them. Slay them. So according to Ezekiel, it looks like that everybody was lost. So we see in verses 8, it says there, it came to pass, I'm going to read verse 8 again, but it came to pass that while they were slaying them, and I, Ezekiel says, I was left, and I fell upon my face and cried and said, Oh Lord God, would I destroy all the residents, residues of Israel in their pouring out of the glory upon Jerusalem? So we see here that Ezekiel see that everybody's been destroyed. So he's crying out to God, God, are you going to destroy everything in Jerusalem? So according to Ezekiel, it looks like everybody was lost. Remember the quotation, the quotation that the church is about to fall? That it looks like the church is about to fall? Um, and that it looks like everybody is going to receive the mark of the beast in the quotation? 
where it looks at the charge in, in, in NYC, she looks and sees that the charge is about to fall. It's like there's no one saying this. Everybody's going to see the mark of this. The prophet says, she trembles. The prophet says, she trembles for our people for this moment. That she trembles for us. She trembles for us was in the great day when many, many persons would, many those who proclaim the God angel's message, many those who are preaching, who are sharing, are going to receive the mark of the peace. How sad things. How sad things. As it reminds me of a quotation in Kai Controversy 30, was right, when um, the guy was screaming and crying out, whoa, whoa, to Jerusalem. Warning and warning and warning. And what happened to him? He died in the siege. He was warning the people, he died. But all those that he was warning, the Christians that survived and went out. And they survived the siege. But he died in the siege for giving the warning. Let us not be like the man who still all of saints and die in our sins and receive the mark of the day saints. This is the last scripture I'm reading, and then we close saints. In Ezekiel, I mean, sorry, first Kings 8 verse 13. First Kings 8 verse 13. First Kings. Eight verses thirteen. First Kings eight verses thirteen. It says here, First Kings eight verse thirteen. I've surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. A settled place for thee to abide in. Whatever. When someone is settled, will they will never commit sin. Once you settle sins, you will never commit sin. They will be settled forever. They will abide in forever. They will, they will never commit sin through the eternity. Once we settle in the truth, we need to come to a stage saying, where we need to be settled in the truth and we will not be moved. The Satan can focus and focus and we will not be moved because we will be settled in the truth. Satan will come and try to finish his blessing and we will not be moved. Saints, we will end here. And our next topic by God's grace, we're going to continue and we'll see how can we not be moved. So next week, this time, we will continue next week, this time. And this time, we'll bow our heads as we close in prayer. I hope you'll be blessed. And if you've got any questions or anything you want to ask according to the step, you can send me a message on WhatsApp. Or if not, you can uh, on the YouTube channel. You can write some comments and button there, and I'll have to reply to the comments and button of the YouTube channel. I uh, hope you'll be blessed with the message. May God help us to repair our hearts for the soon coming. Let's bow our heads as a common prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for your love and mercy towards us, Lord. We just thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for being in us, Lord. You ask you, Lord, to continue to guide us, Lord, as we enter the new week, Lord. That you may you help us, Lord, Lord, that we prepare our hearts and our minds, Lord, Lord, for what is going to take place, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be settled in the truth, Lord, and to not to be moved, Lord. Uh, please help us, Lord, Lord, to get rid of any sin that's holding us back to perfection. Please, Lord, uh, help us, Lord, to prepare for crisis, Lord, because the question is going to ask who will be able to stand on that great right day. We just thank you so much for writing our prayers. We thank you for giving us. We love you, pray all this unworthy in the name of Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.